All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, last session of the Neuromodulation Symposium. My name is Alena Tolkachova. I'm professor in my biomedical engineering. And um, in this session, we will switch gears a little bit and talk or learn about possibility of altering high-level control of various disease conditions through neuromodulation therapy. As you know, in healthy human, in healthy body, there are two branches of autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic or vagal nervous system that has a certain um, a level of working with each other and provide a balance, sympathetic balance in healthy conditions. However, many diseases um, such as uh, cardiometabolic diseases, arrhythmias, hypertension, heart failure, everything that you can see on the slide, typically associated with increased level of sympathetic activity and decreased level of parasympathetic activity. And in this session, we will hear about several uh, approaches how to treat this or other type of diseases by focusing neuromodulation therapy on a specific organ. And we have three distinguished, distinguished speaker today. He will talk about three, who will talk about these three different um, approaches using neuromodulation therapy to treat kidney uh, and uh, hypertension, to treat, uh, to use neuromodulation therapy to uh, treat splenic nerve. And uh, we also will hear about advances in um, peripheral nerve stimulation for modulating of urinary function. And let me introduce our first speaker, John Osborne. He received PhD in 1986 in physiology from the Medical College of Wisconsin, where he studied near uh, um, neurohumoral mechanism of hypertension. He then went to John Hopkins School of Medicine and uh, did a postdoctoral study in biomedical engineering, focusing on spinal, spinal, I'm sorry, <laughs> spinal level um, control of sympathetic nervous system. John Osborne joined the faculty in cardiovascular physiology at the University of Minnesota in 1998 and was promoted to full professor in 1997. In 2019, Dr. Osborne moved to the Department of Surgery to establish Minnesota Consortium for Autonomic Neuromodulation. He studies the relationship between sympathetic nervous system activity and hypertension throughout his career. More recently, he shifted his focus to understanding the role of peripheral organ uh, specific sympathetic pathways in the pathogenesis of cardiometabolic diseases with the long-term goal of developing device-based neuromodulation therapies. He served on the 2019 National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute Task Force, Hypertension Barriers to Translation. He has published more than 120 papers, and his research has been continuously funded by NIH. In 2022, Dr. Osborne, along with several U University of Minnesota and other faculty, was awarded the NIH U55 grant entitled Research Evaluating a Vagal Excitation and Anatomical Linkages Review Proposal to conduct a global clinical study on the physiological responses to vagal nerve stimulation in human. Welcome, Dr. Osborne. Thank you, Lena. So the last day of the meeting, the last session, 3 o'clock on a Friday. Tough gig, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best here. Okay. Great. So first I want to say, I mean, I was up here yesterday morning to kind of introduce the meeting, along with Hubert and Ziad and Tay, and we had pretty high expectations for what this meeting would be, and it has gone beyond that. I mean, it's really been great to have everybody here. It's been an amazing meeting. So thanks to you that are still hanging out for this last session. So I'm gonna talk about the kidney and hypertension, and really, as Lena said, this is about 
taking neuromodulation right to an organ for a specific disease. We've talked a lot about VNS, which goes to lots of organs and lots of places. And so the idea is to get a little bit more targeted here. So I have a couple of disclosures that are related to what I'm talking about. These are both companies that have uh, catheters for doing um, renal denervation. So I've been studying hypertension my entire career, so it's really irritating to put this graph up. Hypertension is the single leading cause of death and disability in the world, and has been for a long time. Uh, it's preventable largely through diet, exercise, those kinds of things. But what this slide is showing as the, the incidence of hypertension-related mortality has been going up steadily for quite a while, right? So we're not only holding it at bay, it's gotten worse. So that's a huge problem. Now, the current drugs either don't work or people don't take them. So it's estimated about 30% of people with hypertension are drug resistant, which means maybe they don't take the drugs or the drugs don't work. We don't really know which one. There are no new drugs being developed by drug companies. They're not interested in it. So we've, we, we're not gonna come out with some new medication that's gonna deal with this problem. So we really need an intervention that does not involve taking drugs. Again, single leading cause of death and disability in the world, and it's getting worse. So this is the list of drugs for treating hypertension, uh, starting with diuretics on the top, and there's a whole long list of them. And what I've highlighted in red are drugs that either directly or indirectly reduce the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. And they're effective, but so this is an extension of Jeannie Park's talk yesterday on hypertension. I'll be talking a bit about some of the things she did. There are side effects with these drugs, so, so, so that's an issue. And they act globally in the body, which is another issue. And this is based on a really outdated concept. When I say the sympathetic nervous system, I say, you know, everything's an adrenaline rush. My sympathetic activity goes up to everywhere in my body all at once. And so this is the idea, well, let's give drugs that block everything all at once. So it's a globally acting treatment. The side effects are the sympathetic nervous system regulates lots of things besides your blood pressure. So you're gonna have, you get dizzy when you stand up, you have a dry mouth, sexual dysfunction, bradycardia, and hypertension has no symptoms. You don't feel anything with high blood pressure. You take the medication, you feel worse. So that's, that's the issue. So, but what we really know is the sympathetic nervous system to each organ is regulated very discreetly depending on whatever the specific state is in the moment, right? So on the top there, cardiac sympathetic nerve activity, splanchnic, renal, lumbar can all be regulated differently. And the idea is they probably are altered differently in different disease states too, whether that's hypertension or any of the others. So the idea has emerged that the sympathetic nervous system is important, and maybe it's the sympathetic activity to the kidney specifically that's the problem. The kidney controls your blood volume, how much sodium you retain. So, so the idea is maybe it's the nerves to the kidney that are the issue. So that leads to the idea, well, maybe we can do an ablation, and I'm gonna be talking about ablation therapy, and then I'm gonna end with talking about neuromodulation. So like every other organ in the body, the sympathetic nerves travel along, the blood vessel into the organ, and you can see there that, um, my pointer, oh, there we go. You can see that here are the nerves right here. This is a human renal artery, and they're just on the wall or just beyond that. So the idea is if you can get a catheter in there, you can go after those nerves, and, and interventional cardiologists put catheters in renal arteries all the time to put in a stent, for example. So clinical trials of renal nerve uh, ablation. So the idea here is what I'm, what I'm showing is that the renal nerves control renin release, tubular sodium reabsorption, and the tone of the blood vessels, as well as renal inflammation that I'll, I'll show you in a second. So if we can denervate those, maybe we can reverse all of those effects. So there's three companies now that have some way of getting a catheter in the renal artery and doing an ablation. Medtronic I did it first, and with their spiral catheter, that's a radio frequency catheter, and I can't, oh, there we go. Uh, Recor has an ultrasound catheter, it's in the lumen. It has a cooling coil there, so you just you, you heat the nerves outside but not in the lumen. And then the last one is a fairly straightforward needle catheter that you just inject alcohol, which is gonna destroy the nerves. So all three of those are out there. 
Now, I'm going to summarize very quickly the field, and it, there have been different clinical trials, and there's discussion about whether it works or not. But what I'm going to tell you is all of them work. Radiofrequency ablation, this is the drop. In, these are drug-resistant hypertensives. After radiofrequency ablation, you get drops in blood pressure with alcohol or with ultrasound. And these are different time points. But if you look at all these together, they all drop pressure about the same amount despite the fact one's radiofrequency, one's ultrasound, and one's alcohol. So to me, that means they're all pretty much doing the same thing. So I'm going to summarize a huge field for you and just tell you it does work. Ablating the renal nerves works. Its response is equal to other monotherapies, meaning another single drug for hypertension. It's just as effective. It's about 10 millimeters of mercury in systolic or more, which may not seem like a lot but you reduce cardiovascular incidence, that's heart attack, stroke, all that kind of thing. So what's the mechanism, and what about neuromodulation? So we've been looking at this from many angles in our lab, to what are renal nerves doing, and how are they affecting blood pressure? And I've listed some of these here, and of the people that have been involved, and I'm gonna to touch base on a little bit of each one of these as I go through the talk. So here's what came out of these clinical studies that was unexpected. You denervate kidneys. The idea is you're denervating the nerves to the kidneys so the kidneys will dilate their blood vessels or they'll excrete sodium. But they're looking at people and they're measuring muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which we're doing in the reveal study. That's sympathetic nerve activity to your leg, and it goes down when you denervate the kidney. Many people with hypertension have impaired glucose metabolism. They're pre-diabetic or they're diabetic. That improved in some of these people. There's no question there are a lot of arrhythmias. That's what Lena studies. And the incidence of those goes away. And even sleep apnea goes down after you denervate the kidneys, right? So nobody was expecting it. And these are all good things, right? So the idea, this is a review we put out last year with, uh, um, with Lucy Volchanova and... and, and Roman Tuzinski over here. I'm going to show some of his stuff in a minute. The idea was initially based on the brain-kidney axis. The nerves to the kidney are the problem, so let's get rid of those. But what I'm going to talk about is we think it's all of this. It's the kidney-brain axis. The idea is going to be inflammation in the kidney, which people with hypertension have. There are cytokines in the kidney that are going to stimulate the sensory nerves in the kidney and go up and activate the brain, and then the sympathetic pathways to a bunch of different organs. And that's why if you get rid of these, you see all of these other effects, right? And I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about uh, looking for biomarkers for this. So I'm going to be talking about interoception, and I'm going to be talking about neural immune interactions, as we've been talking about the last couple of days. So these are images of human renal nerves. And what you see, and so uh, these are just different bundles of different parts along the artery. Red are efferent, which I've, there's a color code right there. And then the green are the afferent, and they're all mixed up in that nerve bundle. So when you get a renal nerve on an artery, it's a mix of sensory and motor. About 90% are efferent, and about 10% are afferent. The point is, they're all mixed together. So these catheters that are being used now, when they do an ablation, they're getting rid of both the nerves to the kidney, and the nerves leaving the kidney. So a student of mine, Jason Foss, quite a while ago, came up with a chemical way in, 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 in animals to do an ablation of only the sensory nerves. So this is done in rats initially. All sensory nerves in the body pretty much have a TRIP-V1 channel that conducts calcium in when the neuron's excited. And TRIP-V1 channel, there's an agonist for that channel called capsaicin, which is a red hot chili pepper ingredient which activates that channel to such an extent the massive calcium influx causes death of that neuron, right? And so sensory nerves have that, but the, uh, the sympathetic efferents do not have that. So this is just showing on the top, this is the renal pelvis. Staining there in brown is CGRP, that's a sensory neurotransmitter, and the red is TH, which is a sympathetic neurotransmitter. The bottom is a kidney where we were treated with capsaicin what you see, there's no sensory nerves there, but the sympathetic nerves are intact. And we, have, we verified this in a lot of other ways as well. It's really easy. You open up the animal. You get some gauze with capsaicin. You soak it for 15 minutes, wash it off, put the animal away, and then the, the, those nerves are gone. 
So what I'm going to show you is a couple of animal models where the question is, when you denervate kidneys in a model of hypertension, is it because you got rid of the efferent nerves of the kidney or the centering nerves from the kidney? So the idea here is we induce hypertension, as shown on the top, and then if we denervate all of the nerves, which is what those catheters do, and we see a drop in blood pressure, okay? But if we denervate only the sensory nerves and we see the exact same response, that tells us when we do this denervation, the sensory nerves were the problem. And I'll tell you, there's no specific way to do the efferent ablation. It's only sensory at this point. On the other hand, if we have a model of hypertension and total denervation, afferent and efferent, drops pressure, and the afferent denervation does nothing, well, that's telling us it's the nerves to the kidney that are the problem. And I'll go through this again with a couple of illustrations. So Chris Bannock was a postdoc in the lab at the time. He's a faculty member now at the University of Arizona. And he was studying this model of hypertension called the doca salt model of hypertension. You give an animal subcutaneous pellet of aldosterone, which is basically a sodium retaining hormone. And doca is a synthetic form of that. And a high salt diet. Okay, so you have a sodium retaining hormone, a high salt diet. And you see blood pressure go up over the course of 21 days, about 25 millimeters of mercury. If he denervates all of the nerves to the kidney, uh, that's the X's here, you attenuate the development of hypertension by 50%. They can get hypertensive still, but only by a half as much. But if you take out only the sensory nerves, you get the exact same effect on blood pressure, right? So it's what I was just saying. So this is telling us when you go in and cut out all those nerves, the reason the blood pressure doesn't go up as much is because the sensory nerves to the brain were the problem, not the other way around. Now, this is a really interesting point I want to make here about the neural immune axis. We've been talking about the vagal anti-inflammatory pathway. The sympathetics cause inflammation. We talked about the vagus and the sympathetics have a yin-yang kind of relationship. What you're looking at here, these are measures of several uh, cytokines and chemokines in the kidneys of these animals at the end. So, for example, this is grokinase C here. This is a normal tensive animal, an animal with high blood pressure. This is an animal where we denervated before we induced hypertension. They still have high blood pressure. They still are eating salt, which is inflammatory. They're still eating aldosterone, which is inflammatory. But there is no inflammation in the kidney if the nerves are gone. And this is true. We're looking at, I uh, can't see this far without my glasses. They're IL-6, IL-1, beta, a bunch of them. Pretty much all of these cytokines are chemokines. They go up with hypertension. If the nerves aren't there, they don't go up. And I, I was just talking to Sangeeta before this. She, we think this is neurally mediated macrophage infiltration and activation. It's probably the mechanism, but I don't have time to talk about that. But the th so the other thing is, we said, what, what did, did these things show up in the urine, these cytokines? Because if they did, we could actually use that as a, as a biomarker. So these are animals. Uh, this, Chris did this study. The top is blood pressure again. And this is showing the increase in blood pressure. And this, these are a group that were denervated before. The bottom are cytokines in the urine made at weekly time points. And what you can see here is a bunch of these cytokines, they track blood pressure in the hypertensive animals. But if we denervate the kidneys before, they don't go up. So there's two things here. One, it's a real-time measure of inflammation in the kidney. And this isn't coming from the blood. This is coming from the kidney. And the denervation, again, prevents that from happening. What you see on the right here, this is measurement at the end in the kidney itself of the cytokines. And basically, it's reduced by 50% if the nerves aren't there. So we've seen this over and over again. So there's two ways, the bidirectional thing. Nerves are needed for inflammation. But now what I'm going to talk about is the inflammation activating the nerves, the sensory nerves. Uh, this is a review paper. Um, this would be cutaneous uh, sensory nerves, showing that they have a trip V1 channel, as I talked about before. But there are a number of uh, things that can bind to their receptors to activate, and some of those are cytokines. Cytokines will bind to their receptor in the sensory nerve and activate it through the trip V1 channel, the exact thing that we use to ablate the nerve, right? So the, so the hypothesis is this. This is from one of these hypertensive animals. Those green things are sensory nerves, and there's a macrophage. So the idea would be these cytokines are going right to where those sensory nerves are and activating them up to the brain and driving the hypertension. 
So this is uh, from a grant from a while ago. So uh, basically what I've just told you is that the nerves to the kidney are causing inflammation. And I almost picked up my pointer and pointed to that screen right there. I won't do that. <laughs> uh, hang on, I can see why this is an issue. Hang on a second. My cursor's on the screen now? Oh yeah, okay, thank you, is it? Oh, well, you guys can see it. That's good. Okay. The nerves cause inflammation. T cells and macrophages are recruited, activate, and then cytokines show up in the urine. And I'm going to show data for how this is activating the sympathetic nervous system. I'm going to show you one other model. So Nayara and Mariana have done a model called renal vascular hypertension. This, has been, this was invented in the 40s. You basically take one renal artery and you, you create a stenosis by 50% with a little clip. So one kidney is not getting perfusion. It's the exact same story. So you can see on the left here is the blood pressure goes up when you create the stenosis. This is now over six weeks. And I'm just going to tell you that right in those two lines there, one is a sensory denervation, one is a total denervation, and it's exactly the same. Now, interestingly, water intake. You stenose a renal artery, and that animal wants to drink a lot of water. The kidney's not getting enough blood, sends a signal to the brain, drink water because I need to get some blood to, I, I'm, I'm talking as if I'm the kidney, but that's the idea, <laughs> right? If you get rid of those sensory nerves, you don't, that doesn't happen. So this is telling us the sensory nerves going to the brain and stimulating thirst. And this last graph, which this is, this is a urinary marker for the hormone vasopressin. Vasopressin comes from the pituitary. It goes to the kidney to make you retain water. So now the kidney says, drink more water, release this hormone to retain more water, and that's all through those sensory nerves. Uh, I'll skip by. The, these are the inflammatory cytokines in the urine. It's the same story. They go up in this model. If we denervate the kidney, they don't go up. So you ha the nerves have to be there for the inflammation to happen. So what this is looking like is what I would call and when is not here, she was sitting there before. This is a renal interoceptive pathway where the kidney, its environment has been changed and it's causing a lot of things to happen. Activation of the sympathetic nervous system, thirst. I haven't shown data. We have data that stimulates salt appetite and release of a hormone vasopressin. So behavioral responses, hormonal responses, and neural responses. Now, where, what do these things sense and where are they in the kidney? The kidney has sensory nerves. Every organ has sensory nerves. So Roman, where are you? Raise your hand. There you are. So Roman did his PhD with myself and Lucy Volchanova, and now he helps steer the ship of the Reveal Project. So he's been amazing in many ways. Roman's PhD project was to look at the anatomy of these, of these sensory nerves. So I'm just going to show a few images here. First, for those of you who don't think about kidneys, it has a nephron. It's not a neuron. It's a nephron, and that filters blood and creates urine. So every kidney has about a million of these, filters lots of blood, and that structure right there, it's the capillary surrounded by uh, the tubule, and the blood goes in there, and that's how you start the formation of urine. So that's kind of where all the action is happening in the kidney. This is an intravital imaging image from P.D. Pedetri's group uh, in a rat, and what you see in the center is the glomerulus, and I just want you to notice that pulsing that's linked to heart rate, right? So that's just giving you the image of the glomerulus is sitting there. It has a pressure, and it's pulsing, and it's filtering plasma all the time. So I like to use this image because it almost looks like a brain, and the kidney has a cortex and a medulla, uh, just like the brain does. But I use it, too, because the blue is standing for CGRP, which are sensory nerves, and you can see it all over in the medulla right there. And so typically, people talk about sensory innervation of the medulla. Those green dots are the glomeruli. Roman, using state-of-the-art clearing techniques and neuroanatomical techniques, started to look in greater detail in the kidney. And this is one of the favorite slides. That big thing, that's the glomerulus. That's staining for nephrine, which is the glomerular structure. And the purple uh, lines you see are sensory fibers. And what you see is it goes there and it kind of goes around. And the 3D image you see going there, it kind of tracks around. And if you look closer up here, you can see some of these more close-up images. 
The point I want to make here is the glomerulus is surrounded by what's called Bowman's capsule. That's epithelial cells that surround it. These nerves never seem to go inside of Bowman's capsule. They're on the outside. They're hanging around on the outside. And these images show that even more up close. You can see here, here, and here. And these are like varicosities, which you would see in a sensory nerve. And then Roman's also shown you can have several glomeruli that are connected to one sensory fiber. So it might be sensing from several at the same time. So the, doing the functional stuff with this is difficult. We tried optogenetics. We had some challenges with that, so we haven't got to the functional aspect. But the idea is these sensory nerves sense the pressure of the glomerulus. They send a signal through the nervous system and back and regulate the, the tone by the sympathetic nerves of the input to there to regulate the pressure. We haven't tested that yet but this is the first time anyone's seen these fibers around these glomerular structures. So that's what we're thinking about. So the idea is to translate this into humans if the story holds. So Arthur is a MSTP student in the lab. Lena to my right right here is working on this project with us and Lucy Volchanova in neuroscience to go into a large animal model using catheters that are used in humans to see if this actually applies in a large animal model. And I'd like to say Arthur just found that today he got an, his F30 that he applied for in first try, so, so that was nice. He's in California at a meeting. I wish he was here. But, um, so the idea, and this is the warm and fuzzy part of the talk, which I think we need about this time. These sheep we get to study on a farm in Wisconsin, 45 minutes away from here. And not only do we have a farm, but we have a sheep dog. Can you see Aggie right there, down there looking at the sheep? And we tell Aggie to go get the sheep, and she brings them in for us, <laughs> which is kind of fun. So these sheep have a transmitter that's getting both ECG and blood pressure. It's, get, it's stored in the can. And then when they get near the, this antenna, it downloads to the computer. So they can be running all over the farm, which they do. But when they come in to eat, we download their data. That goes across the road to a garage that has a computer. And this is, this is Dolly. That's the first one we did. This is a blood pressure trace. So they live with the, they're living the dream. And they're living the best life that a sheep can live, but we're monitoring them all the time. So not only is it a large animal model, I think it's a very naturalistic model, uh, which is great. So here's the plan. The plan is we're going to use that peregrine catheter that they use to inject alcohol in humans to denervate but we're gonna inject capsaicin to take out only the sensory nerves and see if that works. And because they're large animals, we can, what you see at these points here in the bottom, zero, one, and four months, we can biopsy the kidney, we can biopsy the heart, we can do RNA-seq, we can get blood samples, we can do all of that and track this over time and see what's happening in this model. This image is showing that it works, the catheter works on the top here. This is a sheep kidney, these are sensory nerves. This is one that was treated with the catheter in the renal artery with capsaicin, and they're gone. These are sympathetic nerves. They're still there. So just like in the rat model, this works. I'm showing you preliminary data, uh, and I'm going to show you some specific aims, so I'm putting it out there. Uh, these are two sheep that we induced hypertension in, and at this time point, they either get a sham, which is this group. They go up to pretty high pressures. The red got total renal denervation here. The blue is one sheep where we did sensory denervation, and we just did a second one yesterday. So we're waiting to see how that goes. But the initial results look pretty similar, kind of similar, to what we've seen in rodent models. So the plan is we're going to look at the, the hemodynamic responses to just sensory ablation and total ablation, echocardiography, all of that. Lena is in charge of looking at sympathovagal tone to the heart, which we predict will change because of the sensory input to the brain that changes that, and also does optical mapping of the heart to look at electrical remodeling. And then by looking at RNA-seq in the kidney and cytokines, we're hoping to develop a biomarker. The idea would be, let's say it's IL-1 beta is the one that's driving those sensory nerves. If it's in the urine, you're a candidate for renal afferent denervation, right? That, that's, that's the idea. So what I'm summarizing here is we think that inflammation in the kidney activates this sensory pathway that can activate sympathetic activity to other organs, right? So if this is true, then neuromodulation should do the same thing. So I'm going to end. So we have an R21 
Zifa is a PhD student in Matt Johnson's lab working with Lucy, and we're doing this in the pig model. And the idea is to start with cuff electrodes, but to see if we can shut those nerves down and see the exact same thing we do if we do an ablation. And then you can talk about closed loop and all that kind of stuff, right? So we're working on that now as well to try to move into the neuromodulation field. So I want to finish with this message. This is the kidney, but I think this applies to almost every organ in the body, as we've talked about. Interceptive signaling is coming from every organ for their normal physiology. Inflammation of an organ could amplify that signal in a way that is dysfunctional and driving the nervous system and maybe other diseases. Then neuromodulation, I'll end with that, is the future of trying to modulate that in an organ-based way. So that's what I've got, and I'm happy to answer questions if you got them. Oh, best slide of the talk right there. I have lots and lots of people I get to work with, so. Okay. Well, since we're waiting for some questions, I can ask whether you can elaborate a little bit on more translational aspect from large animal model to human. What do you anticipate as the problems? Uh, so the, going from the sheep model to the human, for yeah. example. Well, one thing with the cap capsaicin stimulates nerves and can cause pain, right? So, but these are done under anesthesia. There's really no issues there with that. Um, we're using a catheter that's already using clinical trials in humans anyway. And maybe I'm naive. I don't think it would be that big of a stretch to go to humans if we show this works. People ask, well, you can just denervate the kidney. Why not just do the whole thing? Because that works. And the answer to that is studies have shown if you don't have nerves going to your kidneys and you go into shock, either through hemorrhagic shock, septic shock, you can't control your blood pressure as well. But if we do just the sensory ablation, you could, right? So. I know I'm not answering your question, but I, I think it should be pretty straightforward. Good. We do, actually, I think Marat's going to be talking about injecting things in humans kind of like this in, in a bit. So I think it should be pretty straightforward. Any questions? Okay, there are some questions. Okay. I was going to ask um, for the pig study over here. Um, are you also ablating with capsaicin or are you using a different way to ablate your pigs? Say that again? Are you planning to use capsaicin to ablate your pig models as well? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's, to me, the ablation is a proof of concept that that's a target and what it does, right? So that, that will work in the pig model. But the idea is to do uh, neuromodulation with electrodes to do, like, high-frequency block, if that's what you're asking. So we, we would compare the two and see if we get the same thing. And we have questions over there. Um, yeah, so you showed that... Uh, Where is this coming from? Right. Way in oh, the back. Okay. <laughs> I am she is she way is in the back. In. <laughs> <laughs> I have no chair to sit in. <laughs> um, and so you're just targeting the afferents, right. and you're saying that there are all these good benefits, but the afferents must be doing something important. Right. I know. And so I'm wondering, like, what is the downside? It, does this mean that their thirst regulation might be off? It could. So you, when we see these activated and doing the thing, it's, it is in the disease model. Whenever we've done afferent denervation and just a normal tense of normal, we don't really see much happen in terms of water intake and all those kinds of things. So I don't know if it's just a scenario like with inflammation where they're being driven so hard that that's the issue or not. The other would be uh, pain. I mean, these can convey feelings of pain. So if you have a kidney stone, you might not feel it, something like that. But, um, but we definitely have to look into that. Vaughn's been patient. I, okay. I've got the mic. Yeah. Yep. Um, John, briefly, um, was that just unilateral denervation you were doing? In the animals for the blood pressure, it's bilateral. Right. But in the sheep? In the sheep, it's bilateral. Oh, it is? Yeah, and when I showed the images for the, the nerves, that was a unilateral, just to, to look at the nerves. But in the sheep, it's bilateral, yep. And just when you say the sheep are living their lives, that looks great, but did they read the fine print about the terminal experiments? What was that last part? Did they read the fine print about the terminal experiments that you're doing? <laughs> Redefine the terminal experiment. Well, you know, <laughs> that wasn't very nice. <laughs> 
right here. Great talk. Do you, can you imagine, envision an inverted U in the stimulation parameters where there may be a sweet spot where you're jamming the signal from the afferent up, because mm. I'm assuming that's the purpose, but there could be some parameter that actually might make things worse because you're actually optimizing um, activation of the afferent to some way or For, optimizing the That would the have beneficial effects? No, that would have worsening effect. So are you talking about stimulation like from right. Neuromod now? Right. Well, we don't know. It yeah. could definitely be true. I mean, we have to, the idea is in, in anesthetized animals to look at dynamic renal function while we're doing this and see what's happening, but that's what Zifa's gonna figure out, right? Yes. You've got the <laughs> microphone, you can say yes, right. <laughs> Any more questions? It's hard to say. Okay, one there. Yeah, sorry. So the Oops. you're referring a bunch to like this inflammation that seems to be producing some of these problems associated with the kidney. Um, it's possible you're not an immunologist explicitly, but like, are what kind of work is being done to understand some of the sources of this like inflammatory pressure that's potentially causing the hypertension? I missed that last part. Is there, like, what kind of research is being done to basically, like, look into, like, why do these inflammatory markers exist? Like, so what, what is the cause I've of talked to lots of nephrologists about that. You mean the cytokines in the urine and that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so classically still, the way you diagnose somebody with renal failure is protein is in the urine. And we've been seeing these cytokines. So we're working on the idea, and actually, we have an MD-PhD nephrology fellow in the lab that's working on that. So, but that's not, I mean, that's not typically done, but I'm trying to push the idea that it's a possibility. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions, so we can proceed. Thank you very much. I will introduce our next speaker. Dr. Yu received his PhD in biomedical engineering from Case Western Reserve University in 2004. He then completed postdoctoral training at the Duke University in the Neuroprosthetic Research Laboratory. In 2012, Dr. Yu relocated to Canada, where he is currently an associate professor in the Institute of Biomaterials and Medical Engineer Biomedical Engineering and the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto. In addition to academic position, Dr. Yu is a co-founder, president, and chief science officer for the EBT Medical and STEAM 49 incorporations, all based in uh, Canada. Dr. Yu's research interest includes the development of various neuromodulation technologies for minimally invasive electrical uh, uh, nerve stimulation, urinary bladder stimulation, and peripheral nerve stimulation for modulating the central nervous system. His research has been continuously funded by various funding agencies, such as uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, Canadian Institute of Health Research, and Connex Funds. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, also, <coughs> And I'd also like to thank the, the, um, the organizers for the invitation to come here and speak about the research that, that we've been doing in my lab. Um, disclosure, I, I, as Elena mentioned, that I'm founder and chief science officer of EBT Medical, and there are other intellectual properties related to E10s that we also have filed. So today I'll talk about bladder physiology. Probably you'll learn more about bladder than you'd ever wish to, to know about. Um, we're interested in overactive bladder, and overactive bladder is a symptom syndrome which is characterized by four basic um, symptoms. So frequency, meaning that patients go to the bathroom more than eight times a day, over 24 hours. They go to the bathroom at least once a night, and they experience episodes of urgency. And these are uncontrollable urges that they have to go to the bathroom, and so patients, if they're lucky, they can hold it in until they get there. If not, they... Um, they have leakages, and that's what urgent incontinence is. So that's different from um, stress incontinence is where you cough or you laugh and you, right, you have leakages, so it's different. Now, as uh, most clinicians will tell you, it's a quality of life issue, it's a quality of sleep issue, and obviously if you cannot sleep and if you're suffering from overactive bladder, it will have detrimental effects on your mental health. So it, it is very serious. The prevalence um, is quite high. 
um, in adults. So in general adults, it, it affects about 15 to 80% of adults. Over People over the age of 65, it exceeds 30%. And what's interesting, or maybe unfortunate, is that there's a significant number of pediatric patients. And so there are patients, uh, I'm sure if anyone who, who works in this field knows that even there are patients who get sacral implants, pediatric patients that do. It's that bad. And then as you can see through this spectrum, right, you can sort of glean that there are patients who suffer overactive bladders throughout their life. So it, it, it has a huge impact on, on the human population. The cause of overactive bladder is not known, and so for the vast majority of patients, it's considered idiopathic. There are cases where we do know the cause, such as spinal cord injury, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and these patients are considered neurogenic, and for the most part, medications tend to work the best. Neuromodulation that may or may not work, it's hit or miss. Some interesting facts is that patients, when you look at these studies and when we look at these self-surveyed studies, 50% of the population or, or the people that, that, um, <clears throat> that are diagnosed or, or considered or with having overactive bladder don't even know that they have an overactive bladder or they don't think it's serious enough to seek medical help. And then those pe patients who do feel that it's, it's bothersome, it takes them about three to five years to actually seek medical help. And then finally, when they do get medical help, they're, they're generally given medications to anticholinergics or beta agonists. And it turns out that the, the statistic that most people use is that 80% 80, 80 of patients stop using medication within the first six months. And so there's a lot of refractory patients. And that's where neuromodulation comes in. And as I imagine most of you know, sacral neuromodulation is the most widely used third line treatment for refractory overactive bladder patients. It's about 350 implants worldwide so far. <clears throat> and um, it's, a, it's a minimally invasive surgery. It requires continuous stimulation, and so that's why we have a battery implanted along with the lead wire. And well, the, you know, the, si the downside to that is very expensive, obviously low penetration rates, and there are uh, cases of low loss of efficacy after five or so years. Um, one thing that's clear is that the mechanism is not entirely known, but we, what we do know is that the nerves that are activated by sacral neuromodulation, we can characterize at least what, the ner what those nerves are. And those are specifically the pudendal nerve and the tibial nerve. And I'll talk about how these nerves can, can um, play a role in inhibiting bladder function. So pudendal nerve, or more specifically, the dorsal genital nerve, is known to inhibit the bladder and the mechanism through which, um, by which it inhibits the bladder can be characterized by what's called, what I call, or can be called a rapid onset and rapid offset type of, of effect. So as you can see on the right side, the, the, these are data from um, experimental rats. Down here, it's work that we did at Duke where we stimulated the dorsal genital nerve in anesthetized cats. And what you can see is that even at the peak of a bladder contraction, such as down here, or during the middle of a series of bladder contractions, once you turn on stimulation, it'll stop the bladder from contracting. And then after you stop stimulation, within a very short period, it comes back. And so that helps explain why sacral needs continuous stimulation. Right? So it's not something that you can stimulate for a brief, brief period and um, come back in a week or so. Key stimulation parameters, uh, as this, the, the magic number, anywhere from five to 20 hertz seems to work the best. Um, the amplitude seems to play an important role, at least in this mechanism, and generally it's two times what's called the sensory um, threshold or the, or the bubble sp spongiosis reflex. And what this reflex is is basically, let's say in male patients, if you pinch the, the tip of the penis, it activates a reflex that activates the um, pelvic floor muscles. And so the stimulation amplitude that's needed to evoke that reflex, um, you need to activate at twice that amplitude to elicit this bladder inhibitory reflex. Now it turns out in humans, there's an analogous reflex. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, the same stimulation parameters work equally well. So two times the spinal, bul spinal 
bubble spongiosis reflex and anywhere from 20, 10 to 20 hertz can stop bladder activity going on. So in the left panel here, you can see this is a spinal cord injured individual. We've catheterized them and we filled the bladder and you can see the bladder capacity is about 45 millimeters. That's, that's like one-tenth of what a normal bladder capacity is. And so you see this reflex activity occurring. The second panel here is we're stimulating continuously the dorsal genital nerve and you can see the bladder capacity here has increased by double. And then here, this is a closed loop stimulation where we use the bladder pressure to trigger the stimulator and in this case, it seems to work even better. So again, the same reflex exists in, in, in humans. It's also been shown in idiopathic overactive bladder patients where you stimulate at these, these um, the, the 20, 10 to 20 hertz frequency and two times the amplitude, you get inhibition. So there's that translatability. The second pathway that's involved with sacral is the tibial nerve pathway. And our understanding of tibial, tibial nerve stimulation stems from a seminal paper that was published in 1983. It was a group at Yale where they had looked at acupuncture and there's this location called the SP6 pressure point, and it's about five centimeters above, above the medial malleolus, so it's just above the, the ankle. And they were intrigued by what they've read about, and so they decided to try stimulation and see if it worked in patients. And the published data looks really good. They saw responses in idiopathic, spinal cord injured, and multiple sclerosis patients. So there was that early evidence that this may work, and it took several decades, decades for this um, approach to really um, become commercialized. And so now Labry and Medtronic have these um, treatments. And the way this works, uh, the way I like to, to characterize it, is it's a slow onset and a slow offset type response. So the therapy here is that the patient comes in, they're stimulated for 30 minutes, they go home, and they come back a week later. And they repeat that every week for 12 weeks. And what happens at the end of 12 weeks is that over 50% of patients exhibit a, a greater than 50% decrease in bladder symptoms, and so they're considered responders. And so, so it has a very different mechanism relative to pudendal nerve stimulation. Interestingly, the frequency is, is similar, so they use 20 hertz, and what's really interesting is that the amplitude that they use is just below or at the motor threshold. So, in, in layman's terms, they're just barely stimulating the nerve. But surprisingly, only 30 minutes of stimulation a week can elicit these really significant improvements in bladder symptoms. So when I started my lab in, at the University of Toronto, we started looking at this tibial nerve stimulation approach because it, it's no one, really, no one really knew how this works or why this works. And so we developed this animal model. It's an anesthetized, urethane anesthetized rats. We catheterize the bladder here with a, um, with a PE50 um, catheter, and we continuously fill it. So this is a model which we're trying to replicate, I guess, real bladder function. You fill, you empty, you fill, you empty. And then what we're trying to do is see how stimulation affects that rhythmic periodic activity. And so in the bottom right here, you can see that we collect the urine that comes out, and so we use a strain gauge to measure how much um, volume is, is expelled so we can confirm whether reflex activity occurs. We also measure the urethral sphincter muscle activity, and th that reason for that is in rats, unlike humans or cats, there is this unique high-frequency oscillation of the sphincter, urethral sphincter muscle. Again, th that's characteristic of when... Uh, um, <clears throat> a bladder, reflex bladder contraction occurs. And as you can see here, we implanted a custom-made bipolar nerve cuff electrode on, on the tibial nerve in this case. So one of my first students, Mario uh, Kovacevic, he um, ran these experiments. He applied 10-minute trials. So these are relatively short trials, and he applied them at different frequencies. He randomized the, the, the order and, and the frequency ranges were like 2, 5, 10, 20, 50 hertz. And what he found was that 10 hertz and 5 hertz seemed to work the best. And what you can see here is that, so before the stimulation trial is applied, you can see there's periodic bladder activity going on. 
And afterwards, you can see that there's a spread in the intercontraction interval. So that's indicative of an increase in bladder capacity, right? Meaning that you need to fill the bladder a bit more to get to reach the reflex threshold and the brainstem telling the bladder to contract and empty. So what he showed was that you can achieve these post-stimulus effects, right? So these are longer lasting effects beyond the stimulation. And in a few trials, as you can see here, is that he, he saw this overflow incontinence. Uh, what I mean by that is, so we're continuously filling the bladder and in cer certain cases, the bladder, the contractility disappears. And because of that, the bladder is just continuously filling slowly. And so since there's no contraction, it's just gonna leak to the urethra, right? So it's a passive leakage. And so when, when the bladder pressure inside the bladder exceeds the leakage pressure, you get drops. And, and basically this is sort of a stronger form of inhibition, right? So then Jason, a subsequent graduate student, looked at the idea of, well, what if we looked at this a bit closer, right? So what's causing this, what can cause overflow incontinence and what's the input needed? And so we designed this study where there's four stimulation trials and one of them, as you can see here, um, is applied at zero times the foot twitch threshold, right? The tibial nerve activates tw uh, muscles in the foot. And so this one obviously is a sham. And then we applied 15 times that, 106 times that. So six, 60 represents activation of smaller, um, threshold of activating smaller A, I would say A, A delta fibers, 15T is where you activate almost all the, the A delta fibers, and 100T is where you're starting to activate or actually probably exceeded the C fiber threshold. And so when he, in multiple experiments, he randomized the order with, with which these trials were applied, and what he found was that 100T seemed to work the best for eliciting this overflow incontinence. So the take home message here is that you need to really stimulate that tibial nerve to elicit bladder inhibitory responses in the synesthetized animal model, which when you think about the, the, the pudendal nerve model, that you don't, the amplitude, the stimulation parameters are very similar, right? So there, there's a translatable ability to humans, whereas tibial, tibial nerve stimulation, there's this disparity, right? Where PTNS, can elicit therapeutic effects at very low amplitudes. And so that sort of got me to think, what on earth is going on? Right? What's actually happening? And so what nerve is being activated or how is it being activated and why is there that disparity? And so I looked through the literature and if, and as Hubert mentioned earlier, is that if you look in the literature long enough and hard enough, you can find things that people have done and, and any great idea that you had someone has already done it. And so people have looked at, obviously, tibial nerve stimulation, sural nerve, column perineal, cutaneous branch of the sciatic. All these nerves have been looked at. They've been either tested in animals or in humans. But one nerve that no one had really looked at is the saphenous nerve, or saphenous, depending on where you're from. So the saphenous nerve is a sensory branch of the femoral nerve. So it's the opposite side of the leg from the, from the sciatic and it provides sensory, sensory or cutaneous innervation of the medial side of your lower leg. So when you, look at, when you think of it in the context of PTNS, the needle penetrates through the skin and the tip is located somewhere near the tibial nerve. And so the question that sort of I was trying to answer and, um, <clears throat> or I asked my graduate student here, Chris Elder, to, to look at was what happens when you have a PTNS needle that's placed in the location where you would typically apply PTNS therapy, and can it activate the saphenous nerve? And it turns out, yes, it could activate certain branches. And so what this plot shows, and I'll try to explain it as, as, as clearly as possible, each square here represents the location of the needle tip. So for example, this needle, the tip is located at that location, and that corresponds to that block right, square right there. And so if you follow the color, it tells us that at that location, the needle is activating, um, I would say 60%, I think it is, 60% of 
these um, sap and snare branches. And so depending on the location, you could activate zero. Well, here we're not, we're activating at least one, or we can activate all of the five branches. So basically it's say, saying that there is evidence, at least here, that you can activate the saphenates. Does it really do anything? That, that's, a, that's a completely different question. And so that's what we try to show in the same animal model where we tested tibial nerve stimulation. So the same anesthesia, same animals, well, not same animals, but same breed and, and size and everything. And we placed the electrode instead of on the tibial, we placed it on the saphenous, right just below the level of what you would think the knee, the knee is for a rat. I don't think rats have knees, but right, the, the curvature of the knee is somewhere just below that. And so what Zainab here, a previous PhD student in my lab, what she showed was that, again, if you apply 10 minute stimulation trials, and what you'll notice here is that the amplitude is much lower. It's 25 microamperes. And, and I can tell you that nerve activation threshold for the saphenous is about 17 and a half microamperes. So this is less than 2T, two times the nerve activation threshold. And what she found was that, for, for example, trials where we stimulated at 10 hertz, we can get these long, prolonged bladder fills, which again would be in, indicative of an inhibitory response. And what she showed was basically 10 hertz and 20 hertz seemed to work the best among all the different frequencies that we tested. She took the, this experiment to the next step where she changed the stimulation protocol. So in this case, we're stimulating 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off, 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. So this is 10 hertz and 20 hertz, and we, again, randomized the, the frequencies. And again, 20, 20, 20, 20, 40, 40, 40 on, 40 off. And so what she found was that during these short duration trials, Again, she sees these prolonged intercontraction intervals. And then when we increase the duration to 40 minutes, she starts to see these overflow incontinence episodes. Okay? So it's similar to what we saw with tibial nerve stimulation at 100 T. And so when we looked at the data, it turns out that at least the incidence rate of overflow incontinence was highest at 10 Hertz. And then obviously the 40, stimula 40 minute stimulation trials seem to be the most effective. So there's a dose dependent response here. The more we stimulate or the longer we stimulate, the stronger response. More recently, we, uh, a PhD student currently in my lab, Grant, what he looked at was, so what's the mechanism? Because uh, we know that pudendal nerve stimulation is an intraspinal mechanism, meaning that if you apply pudendal nerve stimulation in spinal cord injured patients or in spinal cord transected animals, you can still inhibit, inhibit reflex bladder activity. Tibial, you can't. And it turns out with saphenous, you cannot as well. So it's in control animals, you, you can see here that after two stimulation cycles, so this is 30 minutes on, 10 minutes off, 30 minutes on, 10 minutes off, and then we see an overflow incontinence episode. So, in control animals, we can elicit this overflow incontinence. In chronic spinal cord injured animals at T8, we don't see it despite multiple trials. So w w at least we know that there, this is a supraspinal inhibitory mechanism. So then the question is, can we do this in humans? Does it translate? And short answer is yes. And so we collaborated uh, with um, Scott McDermott. Uh, he's, in, he's in North Carolina. Greensboro, North Carolina. And um, so what we did was we hijacked the, the PTNS device, and instead of placing the needle at the ankle, we placed it just below the knee on the medial side, such that we can target the saphenous nerve around here. And the reason why we want to do this is because the saphenous nerve, again, it's a, it's a cutaneous nerve. There, there are no muscles associated with, with it, so Unlike tibial nerve, where if you stimulate, you can activate muscle twitches, you, you can't have, you, you, you don't see that. And so we have to confirm nerve activation by the patients telling us that they can feel paresthesia starting around here and then radiating all the way down to their ankle. And so once we confirm that, we followed the same protocol as tibial. So 30 minutes a week, they came back the following week for 12 weeks. And what we found was that we got a pretty good response rate, about 87.5%. And so we see, when we look at individual um, 
symptoms other than frequency. Um, we see significant de decreases in urgency, urgent continence, nocturia, and urgent continence at night. When we looked at the quality of life measures, again, statistically significant improvements all across the board. And so that was great, right? It, it, a pilot study, this seemed to work. And so in some of the patients that remained in the study, we asked them, would you like to use a non-invasive stimulation device where you could take home and use? And this is testimony from one of the patients that remained in the study, and uh, I'll share sort of her comments on this. The gradual piece of doing it with the needle and then going to the machine, I don't see a big difference. I know it works. I know it works because I'm not running to the bathroom all the time. I'm not leaky. You know, I'm, um, I make sure that I do it because if I forget it, I think, okay, my symptoms are really going to come back that quick. They don't because I'm still using the machine. I mean, I love it. I, I mean, it has changed my life. All right, so when she meant there's no difference, it, she didn't really feel a difference in the sensation of stimulation. So, so non-invasive and, since... and percutaneous seem to work. At least she felt it in the same manner. So the next part of the talk, I sort of like to sort of give an overview of the technologies that are, that are emerging in, in terms of peripheral nerve stimulation for treating overactive bladder. And so key, some, some examples that pro are probably well known, Blue Wind Medical and StimGuard, at least a few years ago, right, they have these interfaces which are based on RF radio frequency um, externally powered devices. And so here Blue Wind uses this device here where they do a surgical cut down, they get through the crural, crural fascia, and they orient this so, such that the electrode is facing the nerve, and then they suture the, the fascia to, with these um, holes in here, right? So they, they suture it back, suture this to prevent migration, and they close up the skin and whatnot. So this is one of the more common approaches. And then Valencia Technologies has developed a very interesting device called the Ecoin. It's about the size of a quarter, thickness of about two quarters. And their approach is pretty interesting in the sense that they make this incision, and we all know that implanted devices that are anchored will move around. And so what they do is they surgically make a pouch in the fat, and they drop the coin in. And so they're using gravity to prevent the, um, the coin from moving around. Right? And so they close it up, and um, so they have um, this type of approach where, again, externally, they, you can turn on and off the device, and I think the goal is to replace the device every five years or so instead of being rechargeable. If you've been around in this field for long enough, um, some may remember the neuroprosthesis workshops that were um, hosted at Bethesda, in Bethesda, Maryland, and the stimulus router system was first um, disclosed at one of those meetings. And so Arthur Prohaska developed a, a system where you're externally powering the device with surface electrodes, the implanted component is a nerve cuff electrode connected with a lead wire, and then you have what's called this pickup terminal. So it's a conductive um, terminal which, again, picks up the current from the surface electrode and it externally right, powers this um, nerve cuff electrode. And so this is interesting, but it, again, it's very complicated, right? And so one thing that at least we, that we looked at in our lab is what if you could enhance non-invasive stimulation, so make it more focused, more selective, lower the threshold, by simply modifying the activating function. Okay, so the activating function, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a relative measure of neural excitability. The more positive the value, the more excitable a nerve becomes, or the target becomes. And so the idea was, what if we implanted a, an electrically conductive nerve cuff? Very simple piece of metal, essentially. And if you apply an external electric field or electric current, if we, right, could we modify this activating function and enhance activation? And it turns out it's possible. So in a rat model, um, we did a small or a finite element model 
of a rat tibial nerve. We showed that we can increase the activating function. And then we performed experiments in rats where we compared non-invasive tibial nerve stimulation at the ankle. And on the right side, you can see the foot EMG. And so, so we measured the foot EMG to um, identify the threshold and maximum recruitment. And we compare that with implanting a, uh, in this case, an aluminum nerve cuff uh, on the tibial nerve and then applying surface stimulation. And what we can see here is it's a pretty significant 36% decrease in the nerve activation threshold. So this, this nerve cuff seems to do something, but then the question is, does it work in a larger model such as that for a human? And so Sorab here, it was an undergraduate student in my lab, and he created this, or he, he used this model of the human tibial nerve stimulation. It's a 3D model based on a realistic um, cross-sectional area. And he tested ETENS with the surface electrode, and here we have a platinum nerve cuff placed around the tibial nerve. And the punchline here is that what he showed here is, is the mechanism by which ETENS works. And this is something that wasn't readily obvious until we actually ran the simulations. And so here we have a nerve cuff embedded right within the tissue and it's placed around the tibial nerve here. And in this simulation, the current is going from the right side here towards the left side. So there's a current, longitudinal current flowing from right to left. Now, the nerve cuff, this platinum electrode is highly conductive, meaning that if you have a voltage difference across the two ends of a nerve cuff, it means that you have zero voltage drop, right? But the tissue surrounding it has a finite conductivity. So because of that longitudinal current, you have a voltage difference between the nerve cuff and the surrounding tissue. And so what happens is that that voltage difference causes radial current. So you have current flowing um, on the right side here from the nerve into the nerve cuff. And then on the distal end, you have current flowing from the nerve cuff into the nerve. So you have what, what we call this virtual bipole. So this nerve cuff, one half is a cathode, one half is an anode, and the cathodic end is, is causing the enhancement in nerve activation. Oh, sorry, yes. And so there's the animation of how this works. And I'll, the last slide here basically is Daniel taught this one of my graduate students who look, who's looked at this in the context of vagus nerve stimulation, showed some really interesting results, and I imagine if you've seen his poster, the, the main takeaway is that when you try to activate smaller diameter fibers with increased um, amplitudes, TENS is very inefficient, right? You, in order to activate a six micron fiber, you have to activate or increase the amplitude about 10 times that of the threshold for your largest 16 micron fiber, whereas a nerve cuff electrode or an ETENS device, you can, you can achieve the same activation but with much lower um, amplitudes. So in other words, it, it, there, there's a lot of things that, well, it, it's very efficient, in other words, and it's a long story short. So um, in closing, blood neuromodulation, it's still a very um, significant clinical challenge. There are many therapies out there, but they all don't work very well. And so, and there's a very heterogeneous population. And so it doesn't work. There are very many challenges towards that. Saphenous nerve is one potential novel target that we're trying to commercialize. We have not um, received, or we haven't run our um, trial yet. Um, and then ETENS um, is a novel, again, device that we're trying to, to develop. Hopefully we, we can, that pans out, and obviously neural interface technologies, um, at least in my opinion, will play an important role in, in treating these um, clinical disorders moving forward. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I also thank my, my funding agencies. Thank you. <laughs> I think in the interest of time, please hold your questions until after the oh, session. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. And I will introduce the next speaker. Dr. Fudim received his medical degree in 2011 from Heinrich Hein University, Düsseldorf, Germany. 
He then completed medical residency in internal medicine at the Vanderbilt University, fellowship in cardiology and master in health sciences, all at Duke University. He is currently an assistant professor of medicine at the Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Fudim is a co-author of more than 300 peer-reviewed publications and over 10 patents. He, uh, his recognition list includes numerous awards. Among recent awards, I will just mention the Douglas Zeitz uh, American College of Cardiology Distinguished Young Scientist Award, Duke Heart Center Leadership Council Award, European Society of Cardiology Educational Award. Dr. Fudim's research interests include heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and specifically contribution of splank splanchnic uh, vascular compartment and effectiveness of catheter-based uh, unilateral ablation uh, for development of heart failure. His research has been continuously funded by American Heart uh, Association and Doris Duke Foundation. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. So give me 20 minutes of your attention, I'll be fast. <laughs> you know, in, in my field of clinical medicine, we don't have talks that go 30 minutes, so this is unusual. You know, they're getting shorter and shorter. I had a three-minute talk once. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, I had to add this slide this morning. You know, we are going to turn things a little bit different. I guess I might be the only cardiologist around here, but um, what I'm going to be talking about is heart failure. Heart failure is, like hypertension you heard earlier, is a silent killer. Well, heart failure is not silent at all and is the number one cause of hospitalizations in the United States, unless you consider childbirth to be a medical problem. That's the only thing that's more frequent than a heart failure hospitalization in the United States. But it's a global problem. It's um, two to three percent of the US population. It's really pretty much the same across the Western world. And if you do the math, you know, there are a couple of people in this room that probably have heart failure already. This is just prevalence. This is just prevalence as we speak right now. And it's the population aging, we are at greater risk for heart failure, but also what we experience right now is a massive epidemic of obesity-induced, metabolic syndrome-induced heart failure syndrome. And when we talk about heart failure, there are two large groups. I don't want to go too much into detail, but there's a the reduced ejection fraction, the heart is weak, or you have a stiff heart, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that's the one that's the number one driver. I mean, obesity, diabetes are driving it big time. My mother has it. I mean, it's a very, very, very common disease. And other comorbid diseases, and this comes back to John's talk, because liver and kidney and all of these things are falling into place to be abnormally overregulated with the sympathetic tone. They're uh, not producing the right hormones or producing too many of the wrong hormones. We get into the state of cardiac decompensation. So I'm going to now change gears and talk about cardiac decompensation. So what leads to those number one cause of hospitalization in the United States? Six million people in the United States are affected. There are about one million hospitalizations in the United States alone. Um, we commonly blame it on salt and water retention when patients got hospitalized, and then with diarrhea patients. So it must be that patients are eating too much salt and water. We blame it in my state on McDonald's and Burger King. I don't know what you guys are eating up here. But when you look at your patients preceding a heart failure hospitalization, on the right side, you see that weight gain actually does not occur in average in patients that get hospitalized for heart failure. There's no significant weight gain in average in patients, yet on the left side is what you would see when you have a pulmonary pressure sensor in place. That is now commercially used. It's an LA pressure or PA pressure sensor. And what you see is that these patients have an increase in filling pressure. Same patients that had no significant weight gain have now an increase in filling pressures in the preceding weeks to a month prior to hospitalization. So the discordance. There's pressure elevation in the absence of salt and water retention. So salt and water retention cannot be the sole driver of cardiac decompensation. So another experiment that's really cool out of Scotland, they took 20 patients with reduced ejection fraction, the weak heart, and put them into an early phase unit. Duke has one. Put them in there. You give them a dedicated amount of water, dedicated amount of food, measure how much they pee and poop, ask them questions, do laboratory testing. But most importantly, withdraw all the medications. All the medications are gone. All the good ones that reduce sympathetic tone for example. What you see, these patients had decompensation and symptoms. They had doubling of an anti poor VMP. It's a biomarker of cardiac strain, usually used as a marker of volume retention. Uh, blood pressure goes up. The size increases, uh, the heart increases in size, right then in front of your eyes. And the amount of water on the lungs increases also by over 10%. And all of that, despite classical signs and symptoms of cardiac decompensation in the absence of weight gain. 
So again, salt and water retention or water retention is not, is not necessarily not sufficient to explain cardiac decompensation and heart failure. This might not resonate, I understand, in this uh, audience of a lot of engineers, but in medicine, in cardiology, that is the common thing. The first thing a patient gets is diuretics when they hit the hospital with heart failure. The second and the third is diuretics. The problem is, I'm just telling you, in 50% of cases, there's no need to give people diuretics. Not a shocker here, shocker in other talks. All right, so, spinal compartment. Why do I obsess why I was invited to this specific talk? Well, I am a heart failure cardiologist that couldn't care less about the heart. I believe a lot of the problems are below the diaphragm. You know, I did go into cardiology to study the heart, but I sort of moved caudal. And the problem that we have is that could we potentially explain the discordance of pressure elevations, which is a fact in heart failure, in the absence of volume gain, simply through a distribution phenomenon. So if we want to explain distribution phenomenon, I'll get to that in a second. Let's look where the majority of intravascular blood volume sits. Let's understand the blood volume in the human body. Well, the majority of that sits in the abdominal belly, a little bit more in my case than in your cases, particularly after lunch. And it um, pulls a lot of blood, up to 40% of blood volume. The spleen and liver are pure sponges for blood, pure sponges for blood. And we heard a lot about the spleen here. I'm thinking more of a vascular organ. I don't care as much about the uh, inflammatory components there. But it's densely autonomically regulated. Whether you believe in Mother Nature or God, they put 20 times the nerve endings, amount of nerve endings on the abdominal cavitary vascular structures than that on arms and legs. We obsess about regulating the peripheral organs, but the abdominal cavity has a lot more innovation than other organ systems. Why would that be the case? Well, because if you shift a little bit of blood volume out of that cavity through increase of a little bit of vascular tone, you have massive shifts of blood volume out of the abdominal cavity into the thoracic cavity, and that could lead in a predisposed heart that is stiff, a stiff heart in central vasculature, it will lead to decompensation. Well, I did not get a $20 million gift, so I cannot give you fancy graphics. It won't be 3D reconstructions. This is, this is all I can do, guys. This is all I can do. This is going to be a cheap bottle trick. So imagine this. There's this concept of stressed and unstressed blood volume. The concept of stressed and unstressed blood volume is a functional concept, not an anatomical concept, but those two are very close. Stressed blood volume, think of it as preload, as the blood volume shifted or being located in the heart, in the right atrium, for example. So this is a bottle that's screwed on top. It's closed. I'm not adding any water, simply through the distribution of blood volume out of the so-called unstressed compartment. That is blood volume that leads to the distension of vasculature. I'm going to do a thought experiment with you all. Okay, so this is a more basic crowd. I can, I, I can use your brain for it. It's good. Usually I skip that part. Okay, so take a human body, and that has been done in humans, and connect them to a bypass, like a bypass for surgery. What happens in a five liter, hu human with five liters of blood volume, Three and a half liters immediately drain out of the body into a reservoir when you connect them to a bypass, okay? That, what just came out of the human vascular system is the stressed blood volume. The stressed blood volume that's gone now remains only the unstressed blood volume. The veins and arteries in the human body nearly collapse, but they're not flat, flat, because there's still one and a half liters in place. That's unstressed blood volume. If we reinfuse the one, uh, three and a half liters, that's stressed volume that leads to the distension of the vasculature it's what leads to that bottle to be filled and shift blood volume to the north. The sympathetic tone is the sole driver of the distribution of blood volume between those two compartments, which are functional compartments, because vasoconstriction just reduces the amount of unstressed blood volume without having changed anything about the anatomy. For Jean-Claude Van Damme fans, of those who know this gentleman, so sympathetic hyperactivation, really what, what it does is it distributes blood volume out of the periphery. And here, because the blood volume in the abdomen is so rich and so vast, it primarily targets the abdominal cavity. Remember, 20 times the nerve endings. So that is what the sympathetic tone does. And here comes the kicker. Every time we exercise, blood volume shifts out of the abdominal cavity north. That is the normal process of recruitment of cardiac output. When we exercise, and I'm an exercise physiologist, when we exercise, we double our heart rate at peak okay, as a 50-year-old man, for example. But our cardiac output has to increase five-fold with peak exercise. So people think is heart rate is the main driver of cardiac output. Uh-uh, sorry to disappoint. I have to disappoint a lot of people with that because that's a common thought process. It's preload. It's the increase of recruitment of blood volume to the heart that's driving the remainder three-fold increase in cardiac output. So it's all driven by recruiting preload. And that's not going to happen by increased inotropy. 
the heart cannot increase cardiac output simply by squeezing harder. That's only 10 to 20% of increase of cardiac output. So it's all driven by preload. Okay, so Jean Claude Van Damme helps us even during exercise. But now to another very complex concept in the clinical, uh, in the clinical space. So this one gets a lot of ooh and oh's. I don't know what's going to happen here. You're a little bit too smart for that. But so <clears throat> here's another thought experiment. If you take a heart failure patient, so I'm going to now go only solely into the space of heart failure. If you take a heart failure patient and you say, well, my patient has elevated neck veins. So the, the, the answer must be there must be volume overload. We sort of already discussed it doesn't have to be volume overload. Here's a very practical experience. In clinical practice, I implant CardioMEMS. CardioMEMS is a pressure sensor by Abbott. We drop that sensor, it measures pressures all day, every day. And we send patients home and we call it remote monitoring. It's sort of the gold standard remote monitoring tool. Guess what we do when the pressure goes up? We diarese people. And we diarese people and diarese people. We try to dry them out despite high pressures. So I did this thought experiment with 20 patients. We implanted the CardioMEMS and then we injected radio tracers. And we measured the intravascular blood volume because the radio tracer didn't leave the blood pool. We did a radio dilution technique. You can back calculate how much blood volume they have in that. And then we pool this because every patient is now, of course, different. We standardize it. We do deviation from ideal. So if you are above this plus minus eight zone, plus minus eight around zero. So if you're above, you're wet. If you're below, you're dry. And then that's on the y-axis. That's volume. On the x-axis, you have pressures. If you are anything above 15 to the right, you have high filling pressures. PAD is PA diastolic pressure. That's wedge pressure. That's LA pressure. So yellow box, three out of 20 patients had high pressures, high volumes. Well, that was disappointing. I would have thought more patients will end there. The majority of patients, 60% of the patients, were in the blue box. High pressures, low or normal volumes. I repeat, high pressures but low or normal volumes. So when that patient is in front of you, I always say little old lady in the emergency room has elevated neck veins, clearly in distress, short of breath, there's water on the lungs. I'm telling you, 60% of those would not be volume overloaded, yet that's not how we treat or target those patients. Same thing would be in hypertension. We would tend to, in the past, diarrhea those patients, yet through vasoconstrictive processes, really just a hypertensive process that probably leads to distribution. All right, so I'm going to move on. So pressure does not equal volume. That's a big ooh and ah moment here. <clears throat> tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. <laughs> I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for this. So splenic nerve stimulation. So you, you guys love talking stimulation. Um, so we actually did the experiment. One of my first studies I've done at Duke is we went to the OR, and there's something called IRE, irreversible electroporation. Some of you are familiar with that concept. And they did it for treatment refractory cancer patients. Before they did the Whipple surgery, they blasted the tumor with a lot of current, a lot. And what they saw is that these patients had rem remarkable increases in preload and afterload and blood pressure. So they started doing epidural blocks in these people. They snowed them with gas anesthesia, propofol. These people had no pain, I guarantee you all. We stimulated those nerves, celiac plexus, that's a common confluence of all splenic nerves, and measured all the hemodynamic parameters we could have measured. This is now humans without heart failure. And what we saw is that when you stimulate that for 30 to 40 seconds, blood pressure, arterial, RA pressure, cardiac output doubled within seconds. It's very hard to do anything in a human and double it that quickly. Within seconds it doubled, you turn the simulation off, and it comes down within a minute back to baseline. So it's an on-off phenomenon. As you see in one individual patient here, we've done it in six patients. Then we said, let's go to a heart failure patient. So we went to a heart failure patient, and he, he just underwent an ablation procedure for AFib. We heard about that earlier. And here, because the human is all lined up with catheters anyways, we then obtained permission and we went down the azigas and we stimulate the splenic nerve directly rather than celiac plexus. We went slightly more upstream, stimulated one side, one nerve. What do we see? Same thing. Slightly less of an amplitude, but the pressures went up and left atrial pressure, the RA pressure, the cardiac output, everything went up. Not by 100%, by 30, 40, 50%. But here comes the kicker. When we turn off the stimulator, the pressures did not come down, they remained high. And the difference between those two experiments was, and we have to repeat this experiment now 10 times, is that patients with heart failure, once you have a bolus of 100, 200 cc's from the abdominal cavity, because this is all you do when you stimulate splenic nerves, there's really primarily a volume bolus and just a little bit of SVR increase, you actually, um, you actually will not tolerate it with your heart failure patient because the vascular says, thank you, I don't need any of this because I am stiff. So what is the result? Instead of being compliant to the, to the bolus, it actually results in higher pressures, and those pressures don't dissipate quickly when you stop stimulating. So the concept is in heart failure, maybe 
Volume distribution is a driver of cardiac decompensation. And what if we block those nerves? Could we prevent cardiac decompensation or maybe have it as a treatment? So before we blocked any humans, rest assured, we went back to the literature. And turns out we block splenic nerves all the time, starting in the 1930s. By the way, that preceded the concept of renal denervation because back then we did rhizotomy. We really just cut nerves right and left. And many of those nerves were splenic nerves because for every renal nerve, you have 300 splenic nerves you were cutting because there's a lot more of them. And what we found is that to date, you block splenic nerves for what? You block them for treatment-resistant pain, pancreatitis, cancer that you can resect. So if you have pain, well, kill the pain fibers. You will have no pain. The, pan the cancer is still there, pancreatitis is still there, but you will have no pain. The number one side effect, and that was the aha moment for me when we created this concept, was, well, the number one side effect is people become orthostatic. Orthostatic hypotension, you stand up and your blood pressure falls, really hard to induce, but the number one driver of that is being dry. When you say dry, really what it means is preload to that, that bottle trick, that thumb is no longer there. Because when you stand up, the thumb is supposed to maintain volume in the chest as gravity pulls it out of your chest. That's orthostasis. So if you're hypotensive, that thumb is broken, is not working. So we broke the thumb. That's what they're doing when they do splenic nerve blockade in healthy adults. I would love to induce an orthostatic hypertension-like state in heart failure because it means I underfill the tank, which would be a nice thing to have, of course, without any safety concerns. So we went ahead and we started blocking those nerves using lidocaine. We, we inched our way there. One, we blocked it with lidocaine. What happened in patients with heart failure admitted to the hospital. They're in the cath lab. Pressures are very high. For those that know those numbers, you know, wedge pressure is supposed to be on the right side. Wedge pressure is supposed to be 12 and lower. This is in the 30s, nearly 30. So we, pressures in the heart drop acutely when we block those nerves. And then cardiac as a result, goes up a little bit. So maybe the heart likes a little bit to be congested and setting off stalling, uh, stalling mechanisms. Mean arterial pressure drops. That's not a necessarily a good thing because that would have induced orthostasis. This pressure would have stood up. But that was a celiac plex block. It was a massive block. Two, we then proceeded to take patients that are ambulatory, that walked into the hospital, we exercise them. So let, let me make it clear why we exercise people in cardiology. <clears throat> high pressures is what makes us stop from exercising. When the pressures are high in the lungs or in the heart, that's what causes our shortness of breath, it causes pulmonary edema. We can simulate that in a bike exercise, in the cath lab, they have a catheter in place, they exercise, that's what we do clinically. This is not research, we do that clinically. We see in the black line, when you exercise people, within minutes of exercise, within seconds of exercise, pressure nearly double with exercise and come back with rest. So we blocked these people and brought them back for another exercise one to one hour hours later. Those pressures were dampened. So we essentially, by preventing, arguably, preventing a volume shift into the heart, we were able to prevent elevations of filling pressures in the heart. This did result in a trend towards improved exercise capacity. They felt a little bit better. They exercised for a little bit longer. Sort of makes sense. Small experiments, all single, single arm. So no sham experiments. What we then looked at is we looked at arterial stiffness. We saw that the arterial stiffness was acutely reduced. It was thoracic st stiffness using plethysmography. And then we saw that the amount of water on the lungs dropped as measured by bioimpedance from before the, exercise, before the block to after the block. But every time we exercise, this is the coolest graphic here. This is the cardiac output before, before block during exercise. This is the cardiac output after block with exercise. Cardiac output goes up every time we exercise. This is what happened to thoracic water content before the block and after the block. Of course, I'll show you the best possible case. We pooled it and across 15 patients. It was an average 30% of reduction of shifts into the lungs. So that was an indirect surrogate of what happens with exercise. So I have actually not given you yet a proof of actually reduction of volume shifts, right? Maybe this impedance test. But people that work with impedance cardiography know it's pretty crappy. So what we've done next is we took technetium, we labeled red blood cells with technetium, and injected that. That stays in the blood pool because it's stacked to red blood cells. So now every red blood cell floating around is lighting up as black. And you can see where your blood is sitting. It's sitting a lot in the heart because there's a high density of blood. And then the liver and the spleen lighting up. That's what a human looks like when you just image the blood pool, okay? And then we exercise them under a radioact uh, under a camera, just a gamma camera that records the radiation from that patient. I got my share from radiation from this too. I should, let's look quite close to those patients. Here's how it works. So this is a cool test. We exercise them, and before we exercise them, we just took five minutes of rest recording, and this is on what we, re what we measure. I, I'm not going to count the counts. I'm going to count the ratio of chest to abdomen and standardize it with the computer algorithm. The thorax to abdominal ratio was here two point something, and then we 
exercise them. Black part to black part. Re exercise the thorax to abdominal ratio rises. So this the net shift of blood from the abdomen to the chest. Very simple. I'm not saying how much. I'm just saying there's a net shift. Probably 100, 200 cc's. And then when we block it post, and that's one month later, we blocked them with Botox. And they came back one month later, celiac plexus blocked with Botox. We were able to demonstrate that there was a reduction in resting thoracic abdominal ratio because arguably there's more counts in the abdomen versus the chest. And then the same thing with exercise. This is another patient where the ratio was somewhat similar, but it was less effective rest, more effective with exercise. You can imagine the different phenotypes. We didn't catch the same amount of nerves, et cetera, et cetera. But it certainly demonstrated for the first time we actually do prevent shifting of blood as the mechanism of action for spongy nerve blockade. Okay. Well, this is all short-term. Botox, as I know from my wife, only lasts for three to six months. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. No lies detected. So the... Uh, so the, we went on and actually cut the nurse. And I couldn't do that at Duke. They would have fired me right away if I would have done that. So we went actually to Eastern Europe. A little easier to do things over there. So we went and we actually cut the nerve unilaterally in patients with preserved ejection fraction. Single arm study. We cut it on the right side. The beauty of cutting a nerve, you got it in your hand. This is a picture on histology. You know he cut the nerve. There was no question of what was removed. And then we follow our patients. So what you see here, all the way out to 12 months, red is pre 12 months is black. We actually exercise them every three months thereafter. Bless their hearts. That's what we say in the South. So we exercise them all the way up to 12 months, and we saw that there was a persistent reduction in filling pressures with the rest and exercise. If you recognize those curves, very similar to what I showed acutely, that we're able to reduce exercise, induce filling pressures. People did exercise a little bit further. It had a higher peak VO2. That's how we measure objectively peak performance. Okay, a few more slides left. Catheter-based approach. Of course, now we went on and delivered the catheter-based approach because if we can ablate those nerves percutaneously, could there be a, a transvenous approach? Yes, there is. There's an RF-based technology which allows you to burn a nerve on the right side via a transvenous approach. You go down the IVC, SVC, azygous, and go down all the way into the intercostal veins. Relatively easy to do. Even I can do it. In my hands, I'm not the best. So this is a cool experiment. That's what I promised John that I will show. <clears throat> There are not many experiments like that in humans, all right? So what we have done is on top, and this is not publication rate, that's why it looks so ugly. What we've done is we found the nerve, we visualized the nerve, we stimulated the nerve transvenously, and what we de demonstrated, what I showed you earlier, the pressures go up, they stay up for a while if you actually would draw a baseline. This stays above baseline for 10 minutes here. The patient did not like that, what we were doing. He's sedated on the table, no pain. And then at the bottom, we ablated the patient and brought them back we did it immediately uh, at that time point, and one month later, we stimulated the same location because we tagged where it is, and the nerve was no longer excitable. So we demonstrated we can stimulate the nerve, ablate it, and then it's gone thereafter. So it sort of makes sense just to demonstrate that we don't not burning pleura or some other structures in our area. So we've done a, a number of uh, single-arm observational studies for safety purposes and then demonstrated ourselves, do people actually get benefit from it? Again, single-arm studies. So Stay tuned. You know, there's probably a large sham effect. I will not disagree. People at KCCQs, how we measure quality of life. It's a validated score in cardiology. Leads to approval of drugs and devices by the FDA. People felt better. The improvement was dramatic. I mean, 30 points. Too good to be true. Let's say half of it is true. That would be fantastic. Anything more than five points is significant. It was like 30 points even. Then people tended to walk more. Six-minute walk tests. Again, something that leads to FDA approval for drugs or devices. If you show changes here, 30, 40, 50 meter improvement in patients with preserved or reduced ejection fraction. That's a lot as well. So now, in cardiology, you cannot get approved if you do not have a randomized controlled trial that has ideally sham. So we have designed a sham controlled study that had an open label run in phase first. You want to give, the, and it's now a multi center study because we wanted to roll it out to many centers across the US, a total of 18 centers. And what we've done is that one to two patients were test patients per site where it was open label, the doctor knew what they were doing. Nobody was blinded. <clears throat> so they can practice, and so it's easy to get the site going. That's how the catheter looks. It's an, uh, a saline irrigated catheter. Based on characteristics, I'll skip. Typical heart failure patient, 70 years old, multimorbid. There's six million of them in the United States. There were no significant device-related uh, rela um, device related events related to the catheter itself. Did people have some pain around the procedure? Yes. Was there a groin bleed? Yes, but nothing got perforated, nothing broke in the body, anything like that. It's relatively benign. This is what the pressure looked across 18 centers, across 26 patients uh, before. Then we came back at one month 
No changes in medications were allowed, and pressures were 5, 6 millimeters lower in follow-up. So 5, 6 millimeters does not sound much. That's a lot. That's a lot in cardiology if we drop pressures by that much. So it's not like hypertension, where 5 would not be dramatic. This is a lot for a heart failure patients. If it's sustained, of course, long-term and sustained in a randomized control fashion, because that was open-label data. People felt better. That's what you take away from this figure. There was significant improvement in symptoms, quality of life. People had a significant improvement in six-minute walk distance. It's hard to fake walking longer. That's essentially what that means. If you're old and sick, it's hard to fake walking significantly more. And it's hard to fake having lower biomarkers, but the biomarkers did not change. The stress biomarker was actually pretty stable. A little bit of a red flag, but it was very low to begin with. People with stiff hearts were very low, HEFPEF, uh, and tipo BMPs to begin with. I'll skip that. Okay, on echocardiography, no significant change. There was, the heart didn't really change over time. All right, um, so I'm going to leave you with this slide, because <clears throat> this is important. When we do pilot study, this is a pilot study, 110 patients that are randomized that will be presented in fall of this year. We don't know when, the data is still blinded, but the enrollment is complete. We know that this is just a pilot study. We want to identify uh, responders, and this will be true for your, for your other studies. There's no way, because heart failure is very diverse. I'm going to give you two extreme phenotypes. Some of you might have those as parents of yours. Little old lady, young obese man. Both of them are heart failure, 40 years age difference. Cannot be same responsiveness to any therapy offered to them patient because physiology is so different. So we enrolled all of those phenotypes intentionally because we don't want to play God and know what we, you know, we don't have crystal balls. So we're going to enroll both of them when we have successfully, and we're going to see who's going to respond or not. We know there will be no responders. And with those, we then move on to a pivotal study. Now 700 patients randomized shame control. So this is the summary of all the studies we have done in this space so far. Conclusion, congestion is a complex concept. Pressure does not equal volume. I hope we convinced you of that, okay? The cheap bottle trick. Can you give me half a million? Can these make nice graphics? I'm tired of that bottle trick. Pressure does not equal volume, and the distribution of blood is likely a key driver of cardiac decompensation. Not the main driver. I, don't, I, don't, I can't claim that, but certainly a contributor to it. And then I hopefully demonstrate that splenic nerves certainly play a role for volume management, might play a role in heart failure. And if that is the case, let's burn them and see if we can improve clinical outcomes. Thank you very much. Let's send all, all our...